Bien. Would you care to sit down, folks? Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the press conference for Fox Catcher. And I will introduce immediately the people who are here at this panel. Uh, far left, my left, uh, all I have to say is Spike Lee over the last 25 years and Julian Schnabel in between, producer John Killick. <laughs> Bravo. Sitting next to him, in a minute, sitting next to him, just a few titles, American Hustle, Paul Thomas Anderson's Master, uh, Kathy Bigelow, Zero Dark Thirty, producer Meg Allison. <laughs> Megan Allison. Uh, we've kept our eye on him since uh, The Daily Show. Uh, he keeps surprising us, and certainly this morning he did when we saw the film. Mr. Steve Carell. Skip one, I'll get back to him later. Um, Magic Mike, Side Effects, Haywire, quite a few other films, certainly three with Soderbergh. As one of the two brothers, Mark, Mr. Chen Tatum. <laughs> Scorsese, Ang Lee, Spike Jones, Michael Mann, David Fincher, the list is long. The elder brother, Mark, Mark Ruffalo. Sorry. He's Mark, he's Dave, and right in the center, director, Bennett Miller. Yeah. Filmography short, perhaps, Capote and Moneyball, but already extremely important in the cultural landscape worldwide, I'm afraid to say so. Sir, I'm just quoting someone saying this this morning. Merci, Henri. My pleasure. Uh, first question here, and the second question there. The, the lady here. Hello, Marianne Barrio from AFP. First of all, congratulations on a really great film. Um, my question is for Mr. Miller. Can has seen quite a few films whose families are really unhappy. We've had Grace of Monaco, the Grimaldis are unhappy. We've had um, Welcome to New York. And I was wondering if uh, the DuPont family had been in touch with you guys. And secondly, my two, uh, my two um, uh, question for Mr. Tatum and Mr. Ruffalo. I was just wondering how you prepared for the role. It's quite a physical one. Thanks. Okay, one step at a time. Let's deal with Abel Ferrara first. Um, we had a little bit of contact with some members of the family uh, before shooting, but um, no contact since. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we, <laughs> we uh, prepared pretty uh, pretty intensely. Um, I think we wrestled for about six months, um, five to six months before, and I think Mark and I both have a uh, cauliflower ear as take home presents um, from it and bad knees. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was it was definitely something that kind of gets into your into your body and doesn't leave in a good way. Mark. Uh, yeah, we, uh, that's true. We, we wrestled a lot with um, some real world-class wrestlers. And um, we got to spend some time with, uh, with the family and uh, friends of uh, the Schultzes. And uh, really, uh, Bennett asked us to uh, really immerse ourselves in that world. And so our life became wrestling, eating, sleeping, and um, 
sort of finding out about who these people were that we were playing. Yeah, I got to actually spend time with Mark, the real Mark Schultz. So that was that was uh, pretty special. Well, that actually is going to be one of the questions. The, your character dies, so obviously he could not be on the set. Thank you very much. Uh, yours was on the set. Mm -hmm. How difficult is it to have the, the real character that you're portraying be on the set as often as he probably wants? And maybe coaching you, I don't know. He, he definitely coached uh, me early in the movie as far as wrestling-wise, and then when he was on set, it was such a... a, a a polar, polarizing thing. At times, I was so thankful and grateful that he was there, and at other times, I was completely just terrified. And I don't want to—I don't want to say distracted, but you know, I think it, when you're when you're literally looking off camera and and the person that you're playing is there, it can be. Uh, he, he was he was he was only there for a couple of days, <laughs> and um, Channing, I said, Channing, are you okay with this? And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I noticed him struggling a little bit. And uh, Channing would never say, listen, man, I can't. I mean, I love him, but I just wouldn't say that. But uh, I talked to Mark and I, Schultz and said, uh, I think Channing just needs a little bit of space right now. <laughs> and, he, and he gave it to us. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's such a sweet man. And, yeah, it was, oh, my, thank you. Um, it was a, uh, having Mark there was, was, it was emotionally also very intense because he was sort of reliving a difficult time uh, for him. And so I, I think it, you know, it, it was as hard on, on him too as, as it was on, on all of us because, you know, you go you go through a bad time in your life once, and then you have to go through it again on a movie set. is <laughs> It's a little little heavy. Yeah. In a way, then, Mr. Carell, you had the freest hand of all. I would assume you never met uh, the real John. No, no, I, I didn't. So you had... It, we're totally responsible for your creation with the director, of course. Well, I think there was a responsibility to the the participants. Um, so I, I I felt like there was, you know, th free hand to a certain degree. But uh, I I watched as much as I could. Um, I read as much as I could about him and and tried to gain a semblance as to the the type of person he was. Um, but but yeah, I didn't. He wasn't sitting off camera watching me portray him, so I didn't have that looming over my shoulder. No. Uh, I just wanted to speak quickly to um, uh, my my preparation with the with the family and the friends. Um, very early on, I met one of Dave's uh, closest friends who was uh, living on Foxcatcher with him for six years, and um, and he really became uh, my sort of guide and technical advisor. And we also became very friendly with uh, Nancy Schultz and her children. And we were all sort of exploring uh, the whole time, this, this seven months of preparation with um, these people. And, and, and Bennett was inviting us to um, bring in stories and um, sort of reflections or epiphanies about these people as it related to the story as well. And so we were sort of on an investigative journalism sort of approach to uh, telling the story. Uh, I felt that a lot of times as well. And there was so, everyone was so giving and open and everyone wanted to just ex express and explain their feelings uh, pre and post after everything that happened. And it was, it was a, once a lifetime experience for myself, so uh, I thank you for letting me be a part of it, man. I can't imagine what it was like for uh, for Mark either, having you know, I mean, sorry, uh, for Steve, having Nancy and and the family around as he's playing this this part too. So it was do you remember intense. the day when you met Nancy for the first time? I did. I was, um, and I didn't meet her as as myself. I I met her in character, which was doubly awkward because. Um, <laughs> You know, they, they tried to make me look as as much like DuPont as I could. And um, I, it, it, it was, it was incredibly emotional, obviously. And she's a remarkable woman. And 
as Channing said, very, very giving and uh, very understanding of, of what we were trying to do and, um, and the dignity uh, we were trying to afford her and that she just had uh, intrinsically. So I, yeah, it, it, was, it was sort of an overwhelming experience for me as well um, to meet her and to talk with her. It, it, was, it, it was much better to, to talk with her later when I wasn't um, in character. And, uh, and and get a chance to sit down and reflect with her. Question over there, then over here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Harlan Jacobson from the Philadelphia Inquirer. I'm curious about <clears throat> the degree to which you filmed uh, out in DuPont country, uh, including uh, Newtown Square and how your location guys found you um, places to uh, stand in for the DuPont estate. And also, I'd like to direct a question to Steve Carell, which is that you said you studied and read about um, uh, John DuPont. Can you perhaps expand a little bit more on that and, um, as to how you interpreted the dominant sort of conflicts within John DuPont himself that you had to express uh, in the role? Um, I'd wanted to shoot in DuPont country, uh, Newtown Square, on the main line outside Philadelphia, but um, circumstances pushed us uh, a little bit west towards the Pittsburgh area, and we had some very, very excellent locations people, and Jess Gonshore, our production manager, who I've worked with on Capote and Moneyball and before that on other things, uh, were just you know, brilliant at uh, you know, recreating, but we did get lucky uh, that another family, and I'm not permitted to say which, but uh, a DuPont kind of a DuPont type family in terms of their history and wealth. What's that? Uh, invited us onto their 17,000 acre estate and horse ranch, which you know, had an amazing resemblance to Foxcatcher Farms, and they had never permitted any outsiders to even photograph it before. But, uh, you know, I met with them. Amazingly, we got a meeting, and I sat around a table with characters that could have been in the movie, and um, told them what we were trying to do, and asked for their support, and they'd all seen Moneyball met several times, and, they said, yeah, we'd love to have you do this. And it was the most inexpensive location uh, on, the, on the movie and one that money could not have bought. Oh, and uh, to speak to your question, there's, there's a lot written about John DuPont and his family and, uh, and, and obviously the history of the DuPont legacy. So. I, I did as much research as I could just based on that, based on his, his forefathers. And, um, but beyond that, there's actually quite a bit of video footage on him, some of which he shot for himself. He commissioned documentaries about himself and his life and his, um, his interests. So I was, that was kind of a treasure trove to be able to, to watch those. Um, and, and beyond that, you know, you get different interpretations of who he, who he was or might have been, and you kind of have to just decide on one or, or a conglomeration of many. Um, and it's, you know, it's difficult to say exactly what motivated him, bless you, um, <laughs> and, um, and, and what, you know, what demons he had lurking inside of him, but I think uh, you know, with Bennett and, and with the rest of the cast, we were able to just sort of decide kind of internally what, you know, what, what were, you know, what this character's motivation was and, and what his demons might have been. So I don't, I'm sorry if that's vague. Question here, then here, then here. Go ahead. Pete, Peter Hall from the Toronto Star in Canada. Congratulations to you all. I was uh, really struck by the sound design of this movie and how you use silence so effectively. And also there's the effect of the cacophony like in a helicopter scene. Uh, obviously deliberate and uh, really interesting and I wanted to hear from Ben and Miller about that and also maybe if the actors could describe how that affected your role, so how you, how, how you presented that. Thanks. Um, 
Well, the sound. <laughs> that. Yeah. I, I think that the style of this film and my other films is not so much telling a story, but observing a story. And I try to create a context that will sensitize you to what's happening beneath the story, because there's a lot of American male repressed non-communication happening in this film, and uh, there's a there's a undercurrent, you know, beneath the undercurrent, and every scene is just a tip of the iceberg, and so. Um, the sound is one component that attempts to uh, sensitize you. And, uh, you know, sometimes it pulls back and, as a means to, you know, pull you in and hopefully it makes you look and listen and see what, you know, otherwise you might not have. But also it's you know, it's, it's an adventure, the film, uh, really Mark's adventure. And it is a tour through these, you know, moods and temperatures and colors. And, uh, you know, I think sound, thank you for acknowledging uh, our efforts. It's, um, it's, I think, one of the most underappreciated and often unexploited uh, art form within, you know, the, the m many art forms that make up uh, film. So, thank you. Yeah. Bennett actually would give, uh, I would ask him to give me a song uh, that he would want me to listen to for the scene that, you know, obviously wasn't going to be played in the scene, but he would give me something, and most of the time it was not what I was thinking it was going to be. Uh, and I, I don't know if he was just doing that to throw me or, or what, but it was it was an interesting way to, to go about kind of uh, finding different ways in to uh, trying to get whatever I'm trying to get across. across. And uh, he's just uh, obsessive about behavior and, and like his environment. Uh, you know, if there's ducks that won't shut up in the background, he like loves it for some reason. Like he just, uh, I don't know why, he just, he loves the weird sounds. They, they weren't ducks, they were geese. The geese. And, uh, <laughs> it's very different than ducks. Duck, <laughs> duck, duck honking is the sound of madness. <laughs> What's so that funny says about it all. <laughs> That's it. It's a whole movie right then there. Here. Hi, good morning, Chaz Ebert. Uh, Bennett, you have directed um, another movie, Capote, where the actor completely disappeared, just like with uh, Steve Carell in this movie. And I wanted to know um, what that process is like, because both with your direction of Philip Seymour Hoffman and Capote, and in this movie, they seem to really be inhabiting the person, not just acting. And I wanted to know from Steve Carell, besides the physicality of it, what was the psychology of, of the acting? And I also have a question for John Killick, whom I watched over the years as a producer, and I think he makes very good choices, and so I'd like to hear from him as well. Okay, shall we start with the producers, otherwise you won't hear the sound of the voices. Go ahead, John. Thank you, Chaz. And, uh, I just, I think one thing that uh, Megan and I both share is supporting great artists, great work. And as much as this film is anchored in reality, um, you obviously can't overlook the style of Bennett and the signature of all these actors and what they bring to it. When Bennett first brought me the story and pitched it to me, I vaguely knew about it and hadn't researched it yet. But hearing it through his voice and knowing what the story would become in his hands was what brought me into it and what I'm so proud of. Thank you. Megan? Megan. I don't know. I think John said it pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, about the actors now. Okay. Jazz, I guess the second part is gone. What, what, what? Oh, Chaz, I'm avoiding your question because um, uh, it, it makes me emotional. You know, uh, and last time I saw you, I um, was more emotional than I wanted to ever be in front of people. Yeah. But um, 
to, to work with um, to work with actors, uh, you know, who are, who are willing. To, okay. Uh, I mean, but all of all of these guys, and of, and of course Phil, but to work with actors who are willing to, uh, you know, put faith in you. It's, um, it's you, you have to be grateful for the rest of your life, you know. And I, you know, Steve obviously doesn't resemble anything he had done before, and it, and I'll tell you, as I'm sure he will too, it was so far outside of his comfort zone. Uh, but we met, and we just talked about the character, and um, and truthfully, I'd never seen Steve do anything that would give any material evidence that he could do this, but uh, we just chatted, and I heard how he thought and was thinking about the character. And uh, I mean, I had a vision for it working. I just thought he can do it, and he will commit himself to doing it, and uh, it might hurt, but it, it will get there. And uh, I really cannot imagine anybody doing any of these roles except for these guys. And uh, uh, from my perspective, the, the first time we met, um, Bennett described various scenes in the film as to how he envisioned them, and it's the first time I've ever experienced this, that the the final product was exactly what he had described to me. And um, the, tonally, it was exactly what he had described. And sometimes it was a very circuitous route to get there, but it it, it was astonishing to me that um, all of, and this was years ago, and all of those components came together and all of the people that were cast were exactly you know what you know was reflected on the on the page um in terms of how i approached it i again you know you you, you can do all sorts of research and um and and listening to somebody's voice and watching them and 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 trying to glean some sense of who they are I, but i think ultimately you forget all about that when you start to shoot and and if you've rehearsed enough, it's it's inside of you as you're doing it. So it's not like none of it felt like an acting exercise as we were going through it. None of it felt like we need to do something with this particular moment. It was it was a different experience altogether. And I I credit Bennett with that. And I credit the actors. So, and and we all credit the producers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, thank you, producers. <laughs> <laughs> Something that uh, Mark began to say before about um, you know, meeting all of the people who had something to do with the story um, and their journalistic work uh, and studying what happened and being invited to bring that into the process, it was... <laughs> It really was an exploration. It, it was there was no there were no real like dots to connect specifically. We did not know where the dots were. You know, we knew the soul of the thing that was looking to be incarnated, but you know, from day to day, we didn't know how that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So the amount of research that these guys did, and the ether of the place, which was the environment that was created with so many people who had uh, you know vital roles in this story who were down there with us caring about you know the veracity of this story uh, and these guys you know living it and breathing it were invited to go off road and quite a bit of the film and I mean I haven't done the math but I'm going to say easily more than 50% was spontaneous and another large chunk was, came the night before or the morning of and uh, I mean quite quite a bit was just stuff that they had learned along the way and were able to speak for these characters. Mark, Jenny? 
You want to come around? Um, no. <laughs> Question over there. Hi. Good morning. Baz Bamiyoy from the Mail. Congratulations. It's a great movie and beautiful performances by all you guys. Um, you're talking, Bennett, earlier about undercurrents, and one of the things I picked up was, um, you know, the decline of America, the moral decline. I just wonder if you could talk about that. I mean, it's just, it hit me quite powerfully. I know it's a family drama, mm -hmm. but it's also about a decline of something else. Right. Um, thank you, Bess. When I, um, when I started learning about the story, it, it we see you, Roger. <laughs> and you, Peggy. Hi, Peggy. Um, when, I, when I first heard about this story and learned the details of it, it was so bizarre. I mean, I had never personally encountered anything that resembled any of this behavior, much less wrestling or, you know, such a patrician family or the cultures within. And what happened was so, you know, bizarre and absurdist and sometimes comical and ultimately horrible. But I had never experienced any of that, and yet it felt very familiar, you know, and that within this story there were themes that uh, seemed much larger than the story. And because I really do care about uh, these characters and this story, uh, that's where the attention goes. But it, I can relate it to the world that we live in, our country. But I really, I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I do not want to like venture out and make a comment uh, about it. It's not a political. Film. The film itself does not take a moral position, you know, so much as uh, it's, an in, it's meant to be an investigation, uh, you know, in an attempt to understand and feel uh, some of these dynamics and, you know, towards this point of decline, I mean, it's just, it seems, yes, that's, that's what's happening here and that's you know, what's happening on a larger scale, too. And it's interesting to take a microscope and look at, uh, you know, the interior of the genetics of this thing as it pertains to individuals. You know, one way of looking at the, you know, understanding the universe is through a microscope and the other is through a telescope. And, and this, is, this is the microscopic attempt, but yeah. Mark. You know, I, it did strike me at one point that uh, there, there's a there's a there's a kind of a there is I feel like a moral thrust of the story or like the, the, there's a Greek tragedy b buried in it and in, in that it was what happens when everything has a price tag on it or what what happens when everything is for sale um, what happens when what happens to talent when um, it's for sale, or or that it can be acquired um, by a price, and what happens to people when they're in a system that values almost everything uh, at a price, and modernity. It's modernity, and so. There's those moments that these people have, really, really, really talented people who can't really do what they do best in the world unless, um, unless they can figure out a way how to monetize it. And, uh, but it costs them, and it costs their talent a great deal. And uh, that was a theme that was, it's interesting today, and yeah. it's topical, and it's, it's up for discussion. And the great thing about making movies and films is you could have that kind of discussion in a completely human and relatable way without it being political or polemic or 
divisive or blaming anybody. It's just like a reflection of, mm -hmm. of how we are and where we are. And I really appreciate that, uh, that we got to do that with, uh, with this movie and mm -hmm. this story. And that you had uh, your eye on that ball as well as just being completely honest about yeah. what happened with these it, really I interesting the, people. I think the first question when, you know, I read a, like the first article about the story, you know, these guys were down there with this guy who didn't know anything about wrestling, but he was the head coach of a team of guys who were some of the best in the world, certainly the best in the country. And uh, the first question, I thought just, you know, what's the transaction? Like, really, like, what is the transaction? And how honest are they with each other about it? But yeah, by not kind of concluding anything, and I think we all love to just jump to a conclusion and take a side and good and bad, and, but by really staring at it in hopefully in an unflinching way, but to just keep looking at it. When you don't take a side, then you see past the thing that you're confronted with, and then you just keep looking at it and what's beyond it and what's beyond it. And um, yeah, so I don't know, maybe some people will take it as polemical in some way. I, it's not meant to be. A question there, then the gentleman from Belgium. And yeah. Rogers, uh, you know, we did it. Go ahead. Um, Karen Batt from the Huffington Post. This is a question for Mr. Bennett. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Miller, I'm sorry. Uh, your film is such a powerful and probing portrayal of vulnerability, and as you noted, in a masculine context in this case. And I was curious about your own interest and understanding of vulnerability in this film and in Capote as well, and the specific choices you make film-wise to make us feel it so strongly. For example, this, using sets or close-ups uh, because this was what was very strong for me in the film. And a uh, similar question uh, uh, to Channing Tatum is, what choices did you make as an actor, uh, physically or otherwise, to make us feel this vulnerability of your character, which very much rivets us? Thank you. Well, I, mean, I guess I, I feel like we are all so vulnerable anyway, and it's just a question of how aware are we of it, you know? And I don't think that these characters are really aware of their vulnerability or what would come. And one recurring comment from the many people we talked to was nobody could imagine that this was going to happen, that it would end this way, or that the outcome of these ambitions would be so destructive. But you know who we are and who we think we are and what we're doing and what we think we're doing are, are not always the same. And having the benefit of knowing what happened uh, in this story and the effect uh, that it would have, um, it's impossible not to look at these characters as having uh, these vulnerabilities because what happened happened. And uh, I, you know, like Mark, see it as, uh, as tragic, which is to say uh, it's not random that this is the trajectory of these characters, character. And uh, I think the film attempts to see that, attempts to observe that. So uh, I would say the same thing in Capote. It's, you know, the fault lies not within the stars kind of thing. Jenning? Um, well, I had, I had the uh, sort of unique ability to be able to actually talk to Mark Schultz and spend some intimate time with him. And, uh, you know, and that's always interesting because obviously we're telling a story and, you know, he has his entire life that we can't fit in in 90 minutes or more, or a little more. Uh, 
you know, you obviously can take the physical things of the way someone walks or little small like eccentricities that he has and the way sort of that he thinks or, or, or whatnot. But I think one of the most, I guess the, one of the biggest lessons that I learned on this film specifically, we were even talking about it last night, is like I think I came in with like a plan of like this thing that I've prepared and I was really ready to like just like, all right, first day, I'm on it. And after that first day, I felt like I ruined it. <laughs> like, I was just like, I, I didn't feel like I did anything right. And what I realized after it is that this, this isn't like a, like a bar that I was gonna like jump up and hit, or like, a, like I wasn't gonna score any day. You just keep digging and you just keep mm -hmm. trying to find the truth in, in Mark and in the film and what are we doing in each scene. Each, a scene that is written perfectly, we'd get there and we'd do it and we'd be like, uh, something's missing and we'd spend you know hours trying to figure out what what is you know how can we how can we find it and find the truth in it and I I think the thing is just you know you got to give yourself over to it and sort of just let it come through you know in all the different stages of, of what making a, a movie is and really trusting in the person that's telling the story. There's one character we haven't talked about and that's uh, Madame Dupont, mm -hmm. formidable mm -hmm. Madame Dupont, played by the formidable Vanessa Redgrave. Mm -hmm. uh, was your take on Mrs. Dupont the same as Vanessa Redgrave's? And if not, which prevailed ultimately? Uh -huh. Well, It, 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 again, it's not a polemical thing. We're not like opponents. Like, that, no, I didn't <laughs> there's, say no, you there's, were. No, there's no tug of war. It, it really was a sitting down and discussing, like, who is she? And who is she to him? And, um, you know, the fact of, of uh, the facts that we knew that did include her dying shortly before the Olympics and that, that was the beginning of DuPont's unwinding, and he did you know, find himself marching down to the stable to release the horses, and she did have 32,000 ribbons and trophies from her horse, what would you call them, conquests, you know. Collection. I mean, she was, she was a world-class equestrian, and there's no doubt that, that John DuPont was I think attempting to, you know, compete with his stable of athletes, you know, as she was. But um, we really explored that thing. And um, there were probably, how many different scenes do you think we could have cut out of the improvs of that day? She, she was an incredible improviser. She, uh, I never knew what to expect at any given point. Uh, opposite her. She, yeah, but uh, I mean, she provided many possibilities for this character. Uh, you know, on the day, rolling. So uh, I, 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 think we, I think we ended up being very harmonious with the process. I think these guys, like uh, Chandler was saying, you know, could beat themselves up at the end of the day. But she seemed to just roll with it. I will take one last question. Quick, very quick question, very yes. quick answer. Very quick. Congratulations, very quickly. <laughs> uh, for Bennett Miller and Steve Carroll, you explain your collaboration with Steve. But first of all, when did you have the idea to say, OK, this guy with this big sense of humor can do a movie like this? And Steve, were well, you afraid? You can't make joke. You have to create completely something else. What about that? Thank you. I mean, we had lunch, and I just thought, oh, he could do it. <laughs> that's how that's how I felt. And we had one interesting talk in rehearsal about uh, trying to understand Dupont. And I asked Steve if if he could imagine what life would really be like if he did not have the relief of a sense of humor. And not just being funny, but to see humor in things and what would that really be like? And um, do you remember what you said? I don't remember my response. 
That's because he fainted. <laughs> he was uncomfortable. No, he, um, I, you, you, I just saw you kind of go to a dark place, and I think all comedians are dark. <laughs> and said, no, I cannot, I cannot imagine it. I can't imagine it, which. I, I you know, I, I, I think it's really the same approach you take to a comedy anyway. It's not, I, because I don't think characters in films know that they're in a comedy or a drama. I think they're just characters in films. So, um, you know, I, I, I think the, the same applied to this. I, I don't think, um, I didn't approach it as a, as, as a drama necessarily. It was just a, a story and, and a character within that story. I'm afraid our time is up. Thank you very much, Thank all you. of you, Thank for you being here.